Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. We will begin in a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, the state of the community is about to begin. Please silence all sound making devices. Good morning. We're glad to have you here. Welcome to the 19th Annual State of Community Breakfast. We're aboard beautiful um, New River Marine Corps, uh, excuse me, Marine Corps Air Station New River. It's a beautiful morning. The weather is gorgeous. I'm very glad that you took the time to be here with us. Um, this morning I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and the Governmental Affairs Committee. If you look at your agenda, you will see that I am not Matt Ray. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was detained and wasn't able to be here at the last minute this morning. He's the division chair for the Governmental Affairs Committee. I'm the committee chair, and I'm filling in for him. So hopefully I will do him proud and do you justice in welcoming you this morning. But thank you for being with us here today. It is my pleasure to introduce Jim Roddy to come forward and provide this morning's invocation. May we pray this morning. Our beloved Father in heaven, we humbly come before thee uh, in prayer this morning, thanking thee for another day, thanking thee for a day, another day of service uh, to thee. And we certainly thank those uh, who opened their gates uh, and allowed us to come in and take part uh, in this presentation this morning. We ask that the Spirit be with us so that we will all say and do the things that are appropriate in our lives and are in accordance with thy wishes. We thank thee for all of those who serve this community and this country. Uh, may they continue to do so in concert with each other so that we can uh, look forward to the betterment of our community. We thank thee for those who place their lives on the line for this country. And we ask that thou would bless them and their families as they sacrifice. And Heavenly Father, we ask that thou would bless all of those uh, who sacrifice to any degree uh, for the betterment of this community and, and this country. We thank thee uh, for our families. Uh, we ask that I would bless them. Uh, we thank thee for the opportunities that we have to support each other and to work in the various levels that we do. And Heavenly Father, now we turn our attention to um, the food that we, that we uh, ate this morning. Uh, may it nourish our bodies as we're nourished by the presence of the Spirit in our lives. We pray that Heavenly Father will be with us. We will take the Spirit with us throughout this day, and we do so in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. And with no further ado, it is now my pleasure to introduce Lorette Legan. She is the president of the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce. Thank you everyone for joining us and I want to recognize our sponsor, Jones Onslow Electric Membership Corporation. Thank you so much for contributing to this very, very important event. We appreciate it very much.
I'd also like to recognize the ones in the audience today that chose to serve us in public office, and they do a wonderful job. I'll start with Onslow County Commission Chairman Paul Buchanan. <laughs> Vice Chair Barbara Eichner. <laughs> Commissioner Jack Bright. Commissioner W.C. Jarman and Commissioner Lionel Midget. From the Jacksonville City Council, we have Mayor Sammy Phillips, who will be one of our presenters. Mayor Pro Tem Mike Lazara. Council Member Randy Thomas and Council Member Bob Warden. The Onslow County School Board members are also with us today. Chair Pam Thomas, Brock Ridge, Mary Ann Sharp. and Earl Taylor. And I also want to give a special thank you to Glenn Hargett and the G10 staff for doing our audio visual for today. Thank you so much. At this time, I will introduce the chamber, chamber chairman, Mr. Scott Riggs from First Citizens Bank. Thank you, Lorette. Good morning. I'll echo Cindy's comments of what a beautiful morning it is to be aboard Marine Corps Air Station New River. No snow. <laughs> I'd also like to echo Lorette's comments and thank you, Jones Onslow, for your continued loyal support of the Chamber and this community. We thank you very much. Thank you. As you're hopefully aware, your Chamber is very busy. Um, and on a, almost on a daily basis, there's something that's going on around the chamber office. I uh, would like to call your attention to a flyer that's on your tables this morning, uh, the upcoming business expo. Uh, please take a look at that. It's got a little bit of a fresh look to it. Hopefully, uh, you'll be able to put that on your calendar and, and come to the business expo. And I'd also like to put a plug in for this coming weekend, the bridal expo. Um, that'll be uh, for the first time. Uh, that's looking to be a very nice event and hopefully your schedule will uh, allow you to be able to get out and enjoy that this weekend. We have a number of presenters this morning. I thank them all for taking time out to be here to update us on the state of our community. And with that, we will go ahead and begin. Our first presenter this morning is Colonel Timothy Salmon. He is the commanding officer of Marine Corps Air Station, New River. Colonel Salmon. Distinguished visitors and friends, welcome to Marine Corps Air Station New River. It is an honor and a privilege to host this State of the Community breakfast. As we continue to strengthen the relationships between New River, Camp Lejeune, and the surrounding community. The state of New River is very good. We've been doing a great deal of work to properly care for our two marine aircraft groups, 17 squadrons, and over 17,000 Marines, sailors, civilians, and their family members. We have also been preparing for the addition of two squadrons from MCAS Cherry Point. HMLA, or Marine Light Attack Helicopter Squadron 467, who flies Hueys and Cobras, will be coming to Marine Corps Air Station New River in May of this year. HMH, Marine Heavy Helicopter Squadron 366, which flies CH-53 Echoes, will be coming to New River in the fall of 2015. You can expect the population of active duty personnel and their dependents to increase at New River about 10 percent. For active duty from 6,800 to 7,500 and for their dependents from 7,600 to 8,400. 
As you drove on the air station this morning, you may have noticed several changes since the last breakfast. We've built a new front gate entrance, an entrance to the School of Infantry, a child development center. We've completed VMMT 204 and VMX 22's hangar. As you go further down the flight line, we've erected the mega hangar in the parking area, which will hose, house four VMM V-22 squadrons. As you continue down the flight line to the marina area, we've built a new waterfront community center. And if you were to continue to take the perimeter road around clockwise, you'll notice we are expanding the combat aircraft loading area. We're building HMHT-302 training squadrons, hangar, and parking garage. And we've also completed the youth sports complex by the back gate. When this construction is done, at the end of this year, we will have spent $330 million, much of that going to the local community. I intend to invite you back to Marine Corps Air Station New River for the ribbon cutting ceremony of the Mega Hangar, as well as a base tour. By that time, we will have begun new construction projects, an installation personnel administration center, an installation communication center, the 53 Kilo Training Center, as well as renovating barracks for the arrival of HMH-366. This will amount to additional spending of $46 million. For your information, Marine Corps Air Station New River has an annual economic impact of just over half a billion dollars to the local community. These figures include $400 million in military and civilian salaries, as well as retirees, about 12% of that number. $65 million in construction, $23 million in health care, and $15 million in materials, supplies, and services. This would not be possible without the city of Jacksonville, Onslow, and the surrounding counties outstanding support and commitment to our servicemen and women and their families. I would like to note the relationship goes well beyond the professional and financial needs and addresses the concerns of social and support needs of our community. Last year, New River hosted more than 35 tours for a wide array of organizations, including elementary, middle, and high schools, rotary clubs, local JROTC programs, and youth programs. These tours are meant to cultivate an understanding of what we do, instill a sense of pride and duty, since we are all part of the same community. MCAS Newer was proud to host the Onslow County Special Olympics in December. 173 Marines and 25 students from Lejeune High School volunteered to support 122 special athletes. It was a great event, and I invite you to attend next year. Cheer on those athletes and support their welfare. We are thankful for all the opportunities you have provided us to be an active part of this lively community. Family member employment opportunities abound through chamber-affiliated businesses. We actively participate in the Chamber's Tourism Advisory Committee meetings, Onslow County Sports Commission, Leadership Advisory Committee, and the Military Affairs Committee. North Carolina has a goal of being the most military-friendly state. MCAS New River is committed to working with local leaders to make that happen. It is remarkable and comforting to hear local leaders talk about protecting our training areas and our flight routes, <coughs> limiting encroachment, supporting education and social events for our military and retirees. North Carolina, particularly Onslow County and the city of Jacksonville, are indeed very military friendly, and we thank you for your dedicated efforts. You allow us to defend our great nation by training and deploying some of the best fighting, peacekeeping, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief forces the world has ever known. May God bless you and God bless America. Semper Fidelis. Thank you, Colonel Simon. And again, thank you for your continued tremendous hospitality for allowing this event to continue to be held here at the Air Station. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Colonel Jim Clark, Deputy Commander, Marine Corps Installations East, Marine Corps Base, Camp Lejeune. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, friends, uh, on behalf of General Castelvi, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of addressing, uh, addressing this dis these distinguished leaders on the panel and those in the audience who really form the lifeblood of Jacksonville and, and Onslow County communities. On Friday, our CG, General Castelvi, will be completing his uh, month-long course for all new general officers. This course has required a great deal of travel, domestically and abroad. As an example, uh, during one of our recent ice storms, the CG was slugging it out in Key West, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Though I would point out that uh, this last week he spent some, a lot of time in Uzbekistan, so there is some karma out there. <laughs> I often like to say that, uh, that I've done two tours on Camp Lejeune and two on Camp Lejeune. Uh, <laughs> In Eastern North Carolina, when we talk about community, what we really mean is a single community. You know, the base, the cities, the county. Uh, what affects one affects all, for good or bad. There's, one thing I've always noticed is there's a deep reservoir of goodwill throughout this region, and it is truly sincere. We saw that most recently during, uh, during the ice storms where communication between the city and the county managers, various law enforcement agencies and, and emergency services, it was seamless. You know, we saw uh, just train wrecks literally on, on television of the city of Atlanta, the, the gridlock that occurred because people weren't willing to make timely decisions. We didn't have that here because we all worked together. The large number of you here this morning is indicative of your continued dedication, concern, and commitment to this community. Anyone with a vested interest in the future of Camp Lejeune and the Marine Corps will tell you that these continue to be interesting and dynamic times. Since we met la at this breakfast last year, we've endured sequestration, a government shutdown, budgetary uncertainty, and all the while continuing to focus on our missions around the globe. I want to address just a few issues that may be on your mind, namely the force reductions, budget cuts, and how they're going to affect construction and housing. We've been witnessing firsthand the anticipated drawdown of a high of a 202,000 member Marine Corps to our current numbers of about 193,000 and we're headed toward 175,000 member Marine Corps. Those numbers are very significant. A 175,000 member force emerged as the best we could do in addressing the operational requirements of steady state deployments, crisis response activities, and potential major combat operations while preserving institutional health and readiness. Amid fiscal challenges, America still must respond to global crises, maintain forward presence, and project power. The Marine Corps provides that capability at a cost our nation can't afford. A 175,000 member force we're dropping down to is built around the Marine Expeditionary Brigade. That gives us the ability to rapidly deploy and meet operational requirements of our current and future security environment. Just as an example, the force that's, that's deployed to Afghanistan right now is a MEB-level force commanded by a, a Brigadier General. We are mitigating as much as possible the smaller force size by investing in significant capability improvements, such as the Joint Strike Fighter, the V-22, and the uh, replacement amphibious combat vehicle. These systems are crucial to our ability to project power with a reduced force structure. We will maintain key capabilities, such as the Marine Corps Special Operations Command and Marine Forces Cyber to meet future security challenges. As the Department of Defense strives to cut spending by close to $500 billion over the next decade, we are already feeling the bow wave of fiscal austerity here locally. The Commandant understands that the post-Afghanistan reality is already making adjustments to ensure the Corps' long-term viability as a unique and vital instrument of national policy for years to come. One of the most visible signs of that adjustment 
revolves around our MEF headquarters here aboard Camp Lejeune. In 2013, the Secretary of Defense mandated a 20% reduction in military headquarters across the services. The Commandant announced the elimination of one of our three-star Marine Expeditionary Force headquarters. That affects us here. That's our MEF headquarters. Two MEF headquarters in Camp Lejeune will eventually merge with Marine Forces Command headquartered in Norfolk, Virginia. That move will eliminate 300 billets on Camp Lejeune uh, and, and 94 are going to be transferred to Norfolk uh, by 2016. The smaller 2nd Marine Expeditionary Brigade headquarters will be permanently established at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina and it will leverage its ability to rapidly deploy and meet operational requirements of our current and future security environment. As a leaner force centered on the MEB, we will maintain the ability to rapidly deploy as a scalable joint task force headquarters. These units are ideally suited for the new security environment. The bottom line is this, the Marine Corps mission remains the same and we remain committed to acting as the nation's 911 force. We adapt and overcome on the battlefield and we must do the same in the face of fiscal austerity. So what's this mean for Camp Lejeune? Transitioning from a 202,000 member force to 175,000 is obviously going to affect Camp Lejeune. Those cuts will be collectively felt here and at our sister installations in eastern North Carolina to the tune of between 10 and 12,000 personnel between 2012 and 2017. That remains our current planning guidance. In the short term, we do anticipate additional deployment increases. This past year, 2MEF averaged between 9 to 11,000 troops deployed at any given time. That's 20% of 2MEF. With the gradual pullback from Afghanistan, we expect our deployed numbers to average around 15% of the force or about 7,000 Marines. New requirements are emerging and continue to emerge. Uh, now we're deploying Marines to the Black Sea region, to Africa, and other places throughout the globe in response to crisis contingencies and our nation's security interests. As I've stated before, we're moving away from long-term large size stability operations like we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan and increasing our focus on irregular warfare and counterterrorism. <coughs> to that end, while most of the conventional forces will eventually experience a gradual drawdown, Marine Corps Special Operations Command will not lose any significant structure over the long term. To prepare for our, our global and diverse tasks at hand, we must continually train. I know everyone in this room is probably accustomed to noise, and we certainly appreciate the community's understanding when it comes to preparing our Marines to go in harm's way. As a reminder, and in addition to the noise you're accustomed to, due to daylight savings time and occasional inclement weather events, it is sometimes necessary to grant waivers beyond our normal quiet hour schedule, which goes from midnight to 0600. These waivers are approved so that units can accomplish mission essential training and they are only granted when there's no alternative to meeting those training requirements. Let's take a look at some of the most, our most important priorities, growth and development, because frankly these priorities are directly tied to facilities. We're still in the process of finishing construction projects aboard the base that were paid for with MILCON money from years ago. At the beginning of this year, there were more than 270 ongoing projects aboard the base uh, and, and New River with a value of more than $2.2 billion. Contractors completed $110 million of work in place between October and December of 2013 alone and they'll complete another $330 million before the end of this fiscal year. After 2015, there will be minimal construction aboard Camp Lejeune. We currently have about 4,800 family houses online with a 97% occupancy rate. 
About 400 additional family housing units will be completed over the next couple of years. The 400 includes existing homes being replaced and new homes added to the inventory. Historically, we've always had about 4,500 housing units aboard the bases. We're, we're moving to a, a, a new figure of about 5,200 aboard the bases of family housing units. The Commandant's Barracks Plan calls for two Marines per room is still going to be met. With a few exceptions, unaccompanied Marines in the ranks of sergeant and below are required to live on base. Although Marines who, who have been granted approval to live off base will not be required to break their leases. The $200 million base entry road project, part of Camp Lejeune's five-year plan, probably has the most impact on this community. I know when my wife calls me when she's out driving around, I, a lot of times I'll hear about the traffic situation. <laughs> Very little we can do about it. We just have to be patient. Um, this, this project actually encompasses three separate military construction contracts and a North Carolina Department of Transportation project funded through the Defense Access Road programs. In its entirety, the project will construct a new entrance to the base from Highway 24 close to Bell Fork, a visitor center, and a four-lane road that will take traffic to Brewster Boulevard, Holcomb Boulevard, and Sneeds Ferry Road. And this is vastly going to improve everybody's commute. The new gate and a portion of the base entry road from Highway 24 to Brewster Boulevard are projected to be completed in the fall of this year. The portion of work done outside of Camp Lejeune is being executed by NCDOT with a completion also scheduled for the summer of this year. The remaining section that will com complete the base entry road in its entirety is scheduled to be completed by the summer of 2015. The 2015 completion point marks the point where the road is completely usable, thus relieving that traffic uh, inside and outside the base boundary. Parts of this road system will become available for use over time with the full road and gate system expected to be complete in 2015. Brewster Boulevard widening projects will include a realignment of the various intersections including new access roads to our Naval Hospital complex. Across the road from the exchange, 80% of the Wallace Creek Regimental Complex is complete. The complex now also features the Wallace Creek Fitness Center, a 20 plus million dollar project, uh, one of the nicest gyms and pool areas that, that you'll see on a military installation. Projects slated for completion over the next several months include, but are not limited to, a new dining facility at French Creek, new uh, battalion barracks out at Courthouse Bay for Combat Engineer Battalion, and, uh, and a and as Fish talked earlier, the, uh, the tilt rotor, uh, the mega hanger. Fish, Colonel Salmon, for those of you that don't know his call sign. You'll, you'll forgive me for that. I like their call signs. In October, our Naval Hospital opened a new wing, consisting of a new emergency room and ambulatory clinic. The new emergency room is state of the art. 28 physical rooms vice the old curtained areas. Uh, the new ambulatory clinic includes a family medicine, immunizations, obstetrics, gynecology, and an orthopedic surgery. Many of you were out when we, when we opened uh, the, uh, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, uh, thanks to the generosity of the Fisher Foundation. It's a 26,000 square foot uh, center that represents a revolutionary shift in how Marine, the Marine Corps views and cares for our wounded in a comprehensive and all-inclusive manner. Their vision is hope, healing, discovery, and learning. The NICO is established to provide interdisciplinary diagnostics, evaluations, and treatment of complex traumatic brain injury and psychological health conditions. We talked about the single community a little bit earlier, or I did. And one of the things that, that I'm particularly proud of in this region is our uh, our, our uh, Military Cooperative Planning Group Steering Committee that, that I've got the, uh, the honor of being a, a member with along with Mayor Phillips, Mr. Buchanan, and, and Jeff Hudson, and, and Colonel Salmon. 
This allows us to address a number of issues of mutual interest. It's unprecedented. We're the only outfit in the country that does this at this point, and, it's, and it is very new. Our recent focus has been on maintaining our water aquifers, and the city, the county, and, and the military have provided an awful lot of funding to make sure that, that we continue to have a viable and sustainable aquifer in this region. We're also looking at I'm trying to identify and deconflict jurisdictional responsibilities. Anybody that's ever been around the Piney Green Gate, if there's a, a little traffic hiccup there in the intersection, you'll know it, and the city of Jacksonville will know it. But we're, we're going to deconflict that, and we're going to make that a, quite a bit better until they finally get Piney Green, uh, that road completed. We've also, uh, this board has also uh, taken on the Farmer's Market Initiative which allows a select group of farmers to come aboard the base once a week and sell produce and crafts in the main exchange parking <laughs> lot. Uh, we think we're going to be going hot on April the 15th and we're really looking forward to this and our residents are extremely excited about it. And It's just really another way of demonstrating our relationship or partnership with the, uh, the working lands community under the Sentinel Landscapes program. Our goal is to keep lands in a compatible land use to protect our ability to train and enhance the quality of life for our Marines and to thank our community for being such good partners with us. At Camp Lejeune we, or Lejeune, we want to exploit every communications tool to ensure that our base residents, as well as the local community, stay informed of what's going on inside our fence line. And we're still, we still retain our traditional newspapers and our website but uh, the social platform, Facebook, has really taken off. Uh, we communicate to an audience of over 70,000 folks per week. So whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, uh, or, or our website, I don't really know what Google Plus <laughs> even is. <laughs> Nat, Nat Fahey does that. I'd be lying to you if I knew what, if I told you I knew. Um, but if you've got constructive feedback, or even if you, you just want to gripe about something, like us on Facebook and tell us what you're thinking. So in closing, I hope what I've said today gives you at least a general idea of what's going on aboard Camp Lejeune. There are many external dynamics at work that can potentially cloud the overall picture and reduce our ability to, uh, to project with absolute certainty what's going to happen in the next coming years. Forecasting is very difficult. As Dr. Singletary and I were talking a little bit earlier, it, it's tough to know what the future holds. But hopefully you as a taxpayer and community partner have a better appreciation for what we do. I can guarantee you that we will continue to witness more greatest generations performing magnificently at home and abroad, and they deserve nothing less than Camp Lejeune and the community's full-fledged support. Thank you and God bless you all. Our next presenter will be Mr. Jeff Hudson, Onslow County Manager. Colonel Clark, hashtag great speech. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct honor and privilege to bring you information on the state of our community, Onslow County. You know, time passes so quickly. This fact is never clearer than when we look at how quickly our children and our grandchildren are growing up, or when we drive around and see all the new homes and businesses thriving in our community. Or perhaps when we look into a mirror or pull an old blue suit out of the closet because you've got a thing on the base and you have to look good, but I'm speaking hypothetically, of course. Uh, you know, it, it really only seems like yesterday that I was standing before you for the first time. Amazingly, today marks the fifth speech on the challenges and opportunities faced by this administration. In fact, challenge is a great way to describe the past several years in Onslow County. There's probably not been a more challenging time in this community in the past 50 years. However, Onslow County and its leaders have weathered these storms intelligently 
and prudently, and we are emerging even stronger than before. Looking back over past State of the Community addresses, you would see descriptions of critical developments, emerging trends, and the direction of county government. Rereading those old speeches, you might say that each one of them had a theme. In 2010, the focus was logic as the basis for public policy making. 2011 could have been entitled Financial Conservatism and Wise Investments. The speech for 2012 could have been named Perseverance Through Struggles. You may recall the April 16th tornado and the massive wildfires that preceded that speech. And at that time, there loomed the future uncertainty of local troop levels and the certainty that military construction aboard Camp Lejeune's bases would be coming to an end. Last year marked a great departure from the norm, painting a grim picture full of warnings concerning external forces bearing down upon the county, citing concerns over our housing market and the county's property revaluation. I also spoke about several impending county initiatives, including an internal efficiency evaluation of our county government and the necessity of investing in our infrastructure. Last year's theme may have been summarized as stark possibilities driving government innovation. So why revisit all those old speeches? Because today, the threads outlined in the speeches of the past four years have woven together. The pattern of past work and past warnings now forms a picture of change. If today's address has any theme, it is this. Change is here. President John F. Kennedy said, time and the world do not stand still. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. Friends, if any community should be able to handle, embrace, and persevere through change, it is Onslow. The ability to adapt and overcome is embedded within our very DNA. I mean, seriously. We have ice storms and 70 degree weather all in the same week. <laughs> now, less, less visible than the weather, but no less dynamic have been the changes in our economy, our revenue streams, and the direction of our county government. So let's talk about changes in our economy. There are times when change is not a bad thing. Last year I reported to you that Onslow had a December 2012 unemployment rate of 8.8%. Now according to the North Carolina Department of Commerce, the December 2013 unemployment rate for Onslow is down to 6.5%. That is welcome change. One other change with regard to employment data was the recent announcement that Onslow County has landed Armstrong Marine as a new corporate citizen. We are extremely thankful for the new 200 jobs that will be available to our citizens. Armstrong Marine joins other employers, both large and small, such as Convergis, ST Wooten, J&J Snack Foods, MSA, Oshkosh, Stanadine, Edgeworks, High Speed Gear, and Stumpy's Custom Guns, who have placed their capital in Onslow County and are creating new jobs for our citizens. They know this community is pro-business. It has a great workforce and is a wise investment for their companies. For several years, I stood before you and reported on another type of growth, our residential housing market. Last year, I warned of the possible overexpansion of the market in light of future troop levels and the impending decline in military construction spending. Today, I can report to you that the residential construction market within the unincorporated areas of Onslow County is changing. Our staff reports a 35% reduction in residential permits since last year. Now, although new home production levels have dropped, construction has not stopped. In fact, county building permits are being issued at unprecedented rates in an unexpected area commercial construction. Current commercial permit rates outside of municipal boundaries are 172 percent above those in 2009. Many of these permits are being issued 
to small businesses. Thank goodness, thank goodness for our small business community. As Ronald Reagan said, entrepreneurs and their small enterprises are responsible for almost all of the economic growth in our nation. Changes in economic patterns often bring changes in governmental revenues. With all the new construction, it would be easy to assume that our property tax revenues would be at an all-time high. Unfortunately, our county's property revaluation has exposed a decline in value of the countywide tax base of approximately 3%. This number includes real and personal property, public service companies, and registered motor vehicles. Now, even with the overall loss of 3%, we may still count ourselves more fortunate than many. Although the average single-family home value has now fallen from $179,000 to $164,000, the increase in construction made up for some of the overall loss in total countywide value. The property tax rate is the only type of tax under the full control of the Board of Onslow County Commissioners. 42% of county revenues are derived from, from property taxes. And yet, 33% of the county's land mass will remain non-taxable even after any purchase of Hoffman Forest is finalized. We are mindful of the burden created by property taxes. And at this time, Onslow County has the 64th lowest tax rate among North Carolina's 100 counties. Now, the Board of County Commissioners have made very hard decisions in order to keep the county's tax rate as low as it is despite increasing demands for service from a growing population. And make no mistake, even though residential permits are down 35 percent over the past 12 months, our population is still growing. Evidence of this lies in our school system, where the student population increased by 258 students since last year. In the last seven years, Onslow's property tax rate has only been increased once in order to increase revenue to the county. The most recent change in that tax rate was approved in 2010, and it was actually a tax rate reduction due to the passage of the last local option sales tax. Now, additional sources of revenue are those sales taxes and the funds received from the federal government. The county derives just over 18% of its annual revenue from sales taxes. Sales fi tax figures indicate that taxable sales were down in Onslow County over the past three months when compared to last year. We will continue to monitor sales tax returns carefully as we finish up this fiscal year over the next several months. But you know, another critical source of funding are revenues that we receive from the federal government. Counties across our nation provide services for our citizens that are mandated by the state and federal governments. Mainly, they're mandated in the areas of social services and public health. For many years, we were confident of the stability of those revenues. The federal government shutdown of 2013 cured us of that notion. <laughs> when, the, when the federal government shutdown ended, Onslow was only days away from losing not only funds to provide mandated services to citizens, but also reimbursements from the federal and state governments for administering those mandated programs. We faced the loss of payroll and other reimbursements. We were days away from furloughing entire groups of employees. Thankfully, the crisis was averted for now, and we learned a valuable lesson. When it comes right down to it, don't depend completely on anyone else. Take steps to become as self-sufficient as possible. As the great American humorist Sam Levinson said, remember, if you ever need a helping hand, it's at the end of your arm. Now, I've spoken to you about change as it relates to our economy and our revenue streams. Some of these changes were forecast years ago, and we're mindful of them. In order to deal with the difficulties and take advantage of the opportunities presented by change, county government has intentionally shifted direction on many fronts. To paraphrase a recent Super Bowl commercial, the 80s called, they wanted their government back. We all know that significant change does take significant time. Many of the outcomes we are now seeing result from strategic decisions made since 2009. 
Allow me to point out only a few. The county has become more data-driven professional organization with greater emphasis on providing carefully researched options to the Board of Commissioners. We've become a more lean organization. Aside from the necessary investment required by public safety, county government has 70 fewer positions in 2014 than it had in 2009. At an average cost of 35,000 plus benefits, this represents a savings of $3.5 million annually to Onslow County. We're doing more with less. We've become more aggressive in attempts to diversify our economy. With Jacksonville Onslow Economic Development, the, Chamber of 100, uh, excuse me, the Committee of 100, the Chamber of Commerce, and other economic development partners, we have actively pursued every new industrial lead. We have offered incentive packages when necessary to attempt to land jobs for our citizens. Now, of equal importance has been the support of existing industry expansion. We know the value of companies such as Convergis, who have created 45 new positions since last August. A job created through existing business expansion is just as important as a job created through location of a new business. We've begun making investment in our own government infrastructure. We're doing so creatively. We're stretching our local tax dollars by using occupancy tax funding, grant funds, and partnering with nonprofits and other governmental jurisdictions. The Sneeds Ferry Library and Environmental Education Center is nearly complete. The County Government Center, allowing one-stop shopping for many services, is on track for completion in 2014. Thanks to large FAA grants, the new Onslow County Airport Terminal project has been awarded and is underway, and our entire public safety community will soon have a new emergency radio system thanks to a partnership with the City of Jacksonville. Finally, we have done everything possible to foster innovation within our individual departments. At the landfill, our gas to energy and solar power projects are expected to earn the county at least 1.7 million in profit over the next 15 years. At our animal shelter, we're lowering euthanasia rates by lowering fees and sponsoring special occasions such as our recent Adopt a Sweetheart event. And we have consolidated human services departments to create more efficiency and better customer service than ever before in the areas of DSS, public health, and senior services. We have been so successful in the area of consolidation that Onslow was recently held up as an example to North Carolina's other 99 counties. None of these positive changes would be possible without the thoughtful deliberation and the hard decisions made by the Board of County Commissioners. Chairman Buchanan, Vice Chair Eichner, Commissioner Bright, Commissioner Jarman, and Commissioner Midget have set the current tone of government. We are to be transparent, professional, skilled, and compassionate. And the team that I work beside daily exemplifies these traits. Deputy County Manager David Cotton, Assist Assistant Manager Sherry Slater, Ms. Moxley, Dr. Doyle, Mr. McColl, Mr. Lyman, thank you all for caring deeply about our home community of Onslow. Now, Earlier, I gave you the first part of the quote by Sam Levinson. He started by saying, remember, if you ever need a helping hand, it's at the end of your arm. But he finished with these words, as you get older, remember that you have another hand. The first is to help yourself. The second is to help others. Let us not be defined by apathy, but rather by positive activity. In this dynamic world of change, let us remember to work together in all things, to help each other in all things, and to be worthy of the trust of our community in all things. May God continue to bless and protect Onslow County. Thank you. Our next presenter, Sammy Phillips, Mayor, City of Jacksonville. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sammy. 
Colonel Clark, uh, I Facebook, I tweet. I have no idea what Google Plus is either, but I'm, well, I'm going to Google it before the days are with it and try to, try to figure it out. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you again for the State of the Community Breakfast. Uh, to get started, I do want to recognize, I know we recognized them before, but I want to recognize uh, the fellow members of my city council that are here today. And these folks are some special folks because they, they set the policy, they set the vision, they create the vision for our city, and they set the direction. And I would like to recognize uh, Mayor Pro Tem Michael Lazara. He's here today, if you'll stand. <clears throat> Council Member Randy Thomas and Council Member Bob Warden. These are all folks that are very dedicated to the city, this, this city and the growth of this city. But now I'd like to recognize uh, some members of our staff that are here today. And I'm going to call your name and I would like for you to remain standing. First off, our team leader, our fearless leader, our city manager, Dr. Richard Woodruff. Right there. Our deputy city manager, Mr. Ron Massey. Back in the back. Our assistant city manager, Glenn Hargett, and I have no idea. There he is right there in the back. Our city attorney, John Carter. Our diligent city clerk, Ms. Carmen Miracle. <laughs> Finance director, Gail Maids. <laughs> Our interim public service director, who's doing a fine job, Mr. Wally Hansen. <laughs> Our community programs coordinator, Carmela George. and our HR director, Kimberly Lindsay. <laughs> now, while you're still standing, I do want to say one thing about these folks that are here today. That these are the folks that get the job done. I mean, without them, our vision is just that, a vision. But these are the folks that, that execute what the council wants and gets it done, and we really appreciate the job that you do. And I wanted to publicly say that today. Um, I do want to report to you that the state of the city of Jacksonville is, is good. There are challenges that we're going to face in this coming year, and uh, we're in the process now of trying to get all these little bumps and bruises ironed out and keep things working as they have been. The city of Jacksonville and our dedicated staff have taken steps to help ensure that Jacksonville continues to be a great place to live, work, and play. And we also want to ensure you that the relationship that we have developed with our military community, the military part of our community, will continue to be fostered and grown. And as Colonel Clark, as you mentioned, our cooperative planning group, and I think that's going a long ways to get a lot of things done that affect all of us mutually. Now, I'm going to shift around a little bit on how we usually do things. Uh, I want to show you some of the challenges and successes that we do have. And if you would, Glenn, there's screens here. <coughs> if you'll view the screens. The city of Jacksonville has had challenges and successes, and the mayor and city council have taken action to deal with the challenges and celebrate our successes. Revaluation and its potential effects are one of the challenges dealt with in a recent advanced budget session by the council. Housing values are also a concern for the council, where the session helped with new information about the current status. This year's budget will be difficult, with uncertainties in many areas, but there is a resolve of the mayor and council to improve the quality of life in our community. The city wants to continue providing infrastructure that will allow the economic base of the community and the city to grow. Toward that end, the city has made it easier to use existing water and sewer resources inside the city and has expanded water and sewer to meet anticipated future needs. Helping to make this a great place to live and work is our police and fire services. Both are nationally accredited and our police services has been awarded the status of flagship 
serving as a model for others. The City Council specifically authorized proactive police work that puts community-oriented police officers in areas where they can potentially stop crimes before they happen. Our new fire station, too, is an example of connecting excellent service to our citizens with the relocation benefiting a wider fire coverage area than before. The $30 million Center for Public Safety will come online this summer and be a major structure in the downtown along with the county justice complex. It will provide a safe place to work for our fire and police services and adds to the downtown investments the city has already made. The enhancements of lighting, bridge railing, and gardens to the new Buddy Phillips Bridge, paid for by the city, and the increased height have produced a symbol of pride as well as an improved entrance to the downtown. We're investing heavily in the downtown area because we believe in increasing the economic benefit that can come from this area. New homes continue to be built in the downtown and new businesses are under construction. Without the Riverwalk Crossing and LP Willingham Parks, without the infrastructure provided to improve the area, and without an active role of the city in demolishing dilapidated buildings and building new homes, this would not be taking place. It has spurred much private investment. A significant demonstration is the demolition of the old Fisherman's Wharf. We'll all be watching for something we hope attracts more people to Jacksonville. One place we hope visitors go is the Lejeune Memorial Gardens, where the Beirut Memorial, 9-11 Memorial, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and soon the home of other memorials and the Museum of the Marine are located. Jacksonville believes in the value of tourism and hospitality. The city continues our legacy of a caring community that remembers, with support and perpetuity, to care for the new Beirut Memorial Grove, now under construction across from Camp Geiger. In front of the largest gathering ever, we observe the 30th anniversary of the Beirut bomb blast in October. In March, we'll gather with the Vietnam Veterans Foundation to mark the completion of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Many of you gave your opinion three years ago about how the Freedom Fountain should look. This magnificent fountain is dedicated to all who have come through Onslow County in service to our nation and serves as the continuation of the Lejeune Memorial Gardens. It's already become a landmark and we want to thank the county and the many donors who helped make this possible. The county helped with another place we want visitors to come. Construction is underway at Jacksonville Landing. This is a great example of cooperation as it is a cooperative venture with the North Carolina Wildlife Commission, Onslow County, North Carolina Department of Transportation, and the city. Jacksonville Landing provides a way to launch boats easier than before and it will show off our river, allow redevelopment across the river, and be home to fishing tournaments and other water-based activities. Jacksonville Landing can be another site where events are held to help tourism and diversify our economy. The city values festivals and events as family-friendly activities that build our community and overnight stays in our lodging facilities. These activities celebrate our culture, encourage us to get to know our neighbors better and our fun. We also believe in sport as an economic development activity and are working with others to build on races, runs, and walks that benefit local organizations, but also draw many people from outside the community. We're hopeful the Marine Corps Half Marathon will develop into a major event. An informed citizenry is good. The City Council has acted to put all our advisory committee meetings on TV and on the web. We've operated citizen academies that give behind-the-scenes opportunities to our citizens. Our academies operate each spring and fall, and space is available. Youth are important for the city. The Jacksonville Youth Council gives them a chance to practice governance and to perform community service. The Sturgeon City Institutes have now celebrated their 15th year of inspiring young people to know more about their community, explore career opportunities, and expand their knowledge on many subjects. Our recreation program is strong, and the city has made major investments in parks, ball fields, and areas where our citizens can enjoy their city. We're filling in the old lagoons at Northeast Creek Park for new fields. Our ball fields and gym are also a benefit to the development of sport as an economic development activity. The Jacksonville Jamboree, a multi-day, multi-sport recreation league competition, draws many to the community and provides a wonderful spring festival for everyone. Wooten Park was most recently improved and Phillips Park continues development. These investments take resources and the City Council has provided investments in water, sewer, 
safety, and quality of life to improve our city. The state of the city of Jacksonville is good. Jacksonville continues as a vibrant, young, and livable place that contributes to an improved quality of life for a population that demonstrates we are a caring, active, and welcoming community, as well as the commercial hub of the county. Could not have said it better myself. <laughs> <clears throat> please, uh, please give my uh, G10 crew a hand on putting that video together for you today. They did a, did a great job. This was just for this occasion. But in closing, uh, I do want to comment as the commercial hub of the city of, uh, of the county, uh, new businesses and con continue to locate in Jacksonville. We have a Zaxby's coming, a Chipotle, Noodles and Company, the Mattress Firm, Lowe's Foods, Hobby Lobby a new bakery, Planet Fitness, and two items very special to this former police officer. We have a new Dunkin' Donuts and a <laughs> long-awaited arrival of Krispy, Krispy Kreme Donuts. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, as a big boy, I can appreciate that myself. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. Our next presenter is Dr. Ron Singletary, Superintendent, Oslo County Schools. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Skip Waters, I welcome you to Sunshine today. <laughs> I'm honored to share a few moments with you today to highlight uh, one of your major economic anchors of our community, your public school system. As we gather here this morning, over 25,000 students are being served in 37 schools and nearly 3,500 employees are providing direct and indirect services to those students. My successor, Dr. Kathy Spencer, who retired in July, was a forward-looking leader for the school system for the past seven years. She set a vision that has left an imprint that will last far into the future. Just to highlight a few notables, our high school graduation rate was at an all-time high in 2013 at 87.2%. That is 5% higher than any other place in North Carolina. And while that average has been going up, our dropout rate continues to fall and was at 2.32% for the past school year. This is a steady decline over the last three years. The number of students participating in our advanced placement courses and taking AP exams has increased from 265 students in 2010 to a new high of 411 in 2013 and we have increased our number of nationally certified board teachers to 156. It's been a rare opportunity for me to step back into a position after being away for seven years. I've been able to see programs that were conceptual at the time I left and are now fully operative. One of the major assets of an organization like ours, has always been dedicated and quality staff. This was still a strength when I returned in August. But I now find that our staff's expertise has grown to move us from a good school system to one that is now recognized as the school system to watch east of I-95. Your schools are providing 21st century programs there are global initiatives at all levels and in all parts of the district. We have recently awarded our first international baccalaureate diplomas. These students have now entered the university systems with valuable hours of college credits. The use of technology 
has expanded greatly over the past seven years and is being incorporated in every level of our operations. It is vital and to the work that we do, it is no longer optional. That is likely the same in your place of work. A school system's achievements and accomplishments can be a usable and highly sought after valuable economic development tool. Your school system provides Sheila Pierce and her team with a tremendous resource. Our award-winning basis program, which is co-sponsored by the Chamber and has just celebrated its 22nd year, we are now enjoying support and uh, backing from businesses that have provided continuous support for your schools with volunteer hours that now exceed 572,000 hours and monetary investments that are almost $18 million. We just recently completed a review of our school improvement plans by each of your schools for the Board of Education. I'd like to share just a few observations that I gleaned from that experience. Now my vantage point has allowed me to sort of have a rear view mirror looking back from where I left and at the same time seeing our schools advancing on the future. Your schools are embracing their challenges and are fully aware of their next steps needed. They're open and dedicated to the work that is still ahead. Teamwork has never been more evident. Leadership by your principals and teachers has and is helping to create and sustain an atmosphere for student achievement in some of the most challenging of times. It's important to note that the school's strategic plans are created under an umbrella of the district strategic plan. This district roadmap and a strict adherence to next actions and implementations with fidelity have empowered Onslow to be recognized as a model of excellence. At the state level, our school district has been recognized as one of 12 anchor districts for the Global Schools Network. Nationally, Onslow is a member of the prestigious League of Innovative Schools. This league, sponsored by Digital Promise, is comprised of only 25 nationally selected school districts that have dedicated themselves to technology innovation. Ongoing budget cuts at all levels, continuing student population growth, and having salaries frozen for nearly five years are just a few of the issues that impact the efforts of the work of the district. One challenge that is likely unnoticed and often overlooked by the public is that approximately 20% of our over 25,000 students change their addresses each month. This presents major challenges for our students and their teachers. As an example, 216 students enrolled at a different school on the first three days after Christmas. Now we were already four months into the school year. This mobility is part of being in Onslow, but with ever-changing composition of classroom makeups, sort of like having players switching teams throughout the game. Our schools and teachers are required to work constantly to be sure their instructional programs are aligned to reduce the impact on the increasing diversity and the mobility of the student population. Even with this challenge, strides are being made. The need to provide additional facilities for over 300 new students that have historically arrived, have arrived at our school doors each year since 1949 and maintaining over 3,600,000 square feet of existing facilities remains an opportunity and a challenge for our county commissioners 
and for your Board of Education. Onslow County Schools continue to grow. Not only have we grown an additional 869 non-federally connected students over the last two school years, as mentioned earlier, those 216 new students enrolled in our schools during those first three days after the Christmas holidays. And of those 216, 162 of those were new to Onslow schools. They were not moving from one school to another. They were new to us. I'm confident, though, that the ongoing growth challenge will be embraced through a joint team effort by our commissioners and by our Board of Education. Will the solution be easy? No. Is it important that this community develop one? Yes. Finally, in my brief comments today, I'd like to share with you that you have a new school superintendent coming March 1, Saturday morning. <laughs> He's coming at a challenging and exciting time for schools, for the staffs, for the Board of Education, and for our community. He will find education is alive and thriving in all of our schools. He will find a supportive and caring community. I can't imagine a better educational team for a new leader to join. I know you're going to welcome him and support our new superintendent as he joins not only a good, but one of the best communities, not only in North Carolina, but in the southeast. Now, being an old, good elementary teacher, I like to have show and tell when I do things. So I've come with a real deal this morning. I am pleased that our new superintendent could join us, and it is my pleasure to introduce your next school superintendent, Mr. Rick Stout. Rick, would you stand up? <laughs> Rick, welcome to your new family. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've got a great school system, you've got a very dedicated Board of Education, and you're going to have a new leader that is going to take us to places that we haven't been. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Our next presenter, Dr. Ed Piper, Chief Executive Officer, Onslow Memorial Hospital. Well, good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. People often ask, um, how's Onslow Memorial Hospital doing? My response is, we're working through it. So I think like all of us, we're facing demanding challenges ahead. My report is based on five parts, our culture, finances, quality services, and a little bit about our future. Before I start, I'd like to introduce our board. Would they like to stand, be recognized? Ms. Jamie McGlon, Ms. Atkins, Susan Edwards, Ms. Vanessa Irvin, and Sarah Wilchin. Is that, folks, let's give those folks a hand. <laughs> and, uh, and our executive team, will you folks stand? Be recognized, Dr. Penny Burlingame, Dr. Hagen, Sue Kegley, Danny Waller, Roy Smith, and Amy Sousa. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Every day we work on a fundamental issue, and that is our culture. I want you folks to be um, aware that we work on this every day, and if anyone has ever tried to wrestle with something known as an organizational culture, uh, you know what the leadership challenge is. With the amount of turnover we have, we have uh, 1,200 employees, 150 members of the medical staff, and over 150 volunteers. And I'd also like to recognize them, too, that those folks are behind the scenes right now taking care of patients on a 27-hour basis. So again, our culture is about sensing others' needs and the philosophy of patient and family-centered care. 
where we strive to treat everyone with dignity and respect, collaboration, information sharing, and partnership. Guided by a passion of sensing others' needs and a code of conduct that embraced this challenge as we strive also to improve cost, quality, services, and the patient and family experience. So that's part of our culture, and again, we spend a lot of time on, on our culture. If you've been to the hospital recently, if you had a good experience, I am pleased. If you have been to the hospital and haven't had a good experience, I can assure you we're working on making it, it better every day for everyone. As far as finances, this past year we made about $618,000 in uh, operational income due to a adjustment for his investments for radiation oncology services that has not met our expectations for revenue stream. We had to write off some uh, investments. So the bottom line is we made a few dollars this past year, around $49,000, and that is good based on the climate that we're looking and facing today. This past year, we wrote off $56.6 million in uncompensated care, $14 million in charity care, and $42 million in bad debt. That has increased from the last year around $44 million and the year prior to that around $34 million. We're finding more folks uh, without insurance. Those who do have insurance have such a high copay they aren't able to pay their medical bills. And at the end of the day, we either write that off as charity care or write it off as, as a bad, bad debt. We're an economic engine for this community. Our payroll last year, including benefits, is around $72 million. So we are a vital engine to this community. Uh, we are reaching out in many different services. We opened a wound care center with two hyperbaric chambers, a orthopedic joint center, and a pulmonary uh, clinic this past year. So some of those upgraded services that we're providing uh, to our community. When we look at the challenges before us, the empirical evidence supports the notion that about 15, 10 to 15% of one's health status or the population health status is related to health care services. About 85 to 90% of the health care status of an individual or the population is related to genetics, behavior, social economic determinants. So the fundamental question is, are we going to improve health care costs in our nation, in our state, and in our community if we don't address the fundamental issues of what I call the biopsychosocial economic determinants of our times? Genetics, we can probably do very little about. Blame that on our parents and grandparents. That's the way it is. But we can do something about behavior, the willful destructive behavior that we see every day coming through our emergency department. Spousal abuse, child abuse, aggressive behavior, gunshot wounds, knife stabbings, and you name it, they come to our doors. A lot of costs of health care could be eliminated if we could address a more caring society with a more caring behavior. What we do to our neighbors and our loved ones is unbelievable. We must, as a community, I believe, approach the aspects of what can we do to improve lifestyles and also the socioeconomic determinants of our time related to housing, income, education, and transportation. Without addressing those things, health care costs is going to be a continuing ongoing issue for us. I still believe that the issue of health care rising costs is a symptom of a larger, more sublime issue. And that's the social mores of our society. We are, I consider, the canary in, in the mine cave. The health care rising costs is a symptom of a more sublime issue that we all must recognize if we're going to ever, again, address the health care rising costs in our nation and the utilization. With the challenging times on the Affordable Care Act, our volumes are down, our revenues are down, our reimbursements are down, Medicare is down, uh, Medicaid's down, TRICARE reduction reimbursements are starting this year, 
starting this year and for the next four years, we'll start receiving a $2 million reduction in TRICARE funds. And four years from now, we'll be receiving $8 million reduction in TRICARE funds based on the current volumes. Easily this year, next time, we will be facing probably a six to $7 million deficit. Nothing on our behalf other than the fact that's just the economics of the times. Hospitals across the nation, hospitals across this, this state are facing similar issues and challenges. Based on that, our governing board has decided that this coming year, we would create a strategic plan committee to look at strategic options for the future to ensure the sustainability of our community. So again, how are we doing? We're working through it. Uh, we've had better times. Uh, we are very positive. We are doing a great job with our foundation. I'd like to recognize Jeff Clark. Where's Jeff? Jeff, you mind standing? And the members of the foundation. Uh, thank you. As, as we say, it takes a community to have a hospital. It takes a hospital to have a community. We are interdependent on each of us. And the foundation is doing a great job in helping us. And i also like to recognize Amy Sousa, uh, who led sort of the operational aspects of the Biker Bash. Thank you, Amy, again, for, for a great turnout. And, um, and also thank those who were able to attend Saturday evening's uh, annual gala. I also like to thank our county commissioners for the work that you folks do and the support you provide the hospital and also giving us such great uh, appointees uh, for our board. Thank you very much for that. It, it means a lot in our day-to-day -day operations. So that concludes my report. I uh, hope it came across sort of positive. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way it is. Uh, but I can tell you, we're, we're working through it every day. You folks have a nice day. Thank you. Our next presenter, Dr. Ronald K. Lingle, President, Coastal Carolina Community College. Wow. <laughs> Every year I walk up to this microphone with so many things I want to say, and usually with no time left to say them. <laughs> and every year, the Governmental Affairs Committee of the best led, best managed, and most absolutely indispensable Chamber of Commerce that most of us will ever see gets us all together and reminds us just how fortunate we are to live in this unique military community. I'm going to tell you about three or four sentences about the college and then uh, do my usual wrap-up remarks for what they're worth. The college stands for a couple of simple things. We're about educational quality and student success and not about much of anything else. And for the last 11 years, we have been the unquestioned leader on the state performance measures. And once again, this year, we met or exceeded all of them. So. <laughs> Despite the college's leadership. <laughs> we have been welcomed and brought up to date by Colonel Tim Fish Salmon, <laughs> commanding officer of one of the Marine Corps' two premier rotary wing air stations, and as most of you know with great pride, the training center for the V-22 Osprey. In my next life, I want to look like him. <laughs> Sir, I can tell you when I was a young Army helicopter pilot, I had a four-letter call sign also, and I would take yours every day. <laughs> Thank you for your hospitality, for your good words, and for taking the time out of your schedule to personally host us. We have also received an inform very informative update from Colonel Jim Clark, Deputy Commander of Marine Corps Installations East. 
And as you know, Jim is another recruiting poster Marine and a, a joy to work with, and he is the right arm of the most outgoing, personable, and community-oriented commanding general of Marine Corps Installations East since Major General Bob Dickerson. Jim, please give General Castelvi our regards and tell him we will be watching closely to see if he uses the correct spoon to stir his tea when he returns from the Brigadier General's Charm School. <laughs> I'll probably pay for that one. <laughs> <laughs> to my good friend and one of my heroes, Dr. Ed Piper, who has envisioned, planned, staffed, and personally led the most dramatic transformation of a public community hospital that any of us will probably ever witness. To the hospital board that has unwaveringly supported him and to the Ninja Warrior leadership team that has been with him every grueling step of the way. Oorah! <laughs> I'm an old Army guy, as many of you know, as is Dr. Piper, and I probably should have used their version of the universal military superlative but Colonel Kopka reminds me regularly that saying hua instead of ura sounds too much like a cat trying to cough up a hairball. <laughs> Thanks for your support, Colonel. <laughs> to my all-time favorite public school superintendent, whom I once introduced at one of these functions, as the best superintendent of schools in the galaxy, another hoorah <laughs> for coming out of retirement long enough to serve as the consultant to the Board of Education in their search for the successor to Dr. Kathy Spencer. I haven't had the honor of meeting our new superintendent until this morning, but knowing that Ron Singletary was helping the board, I can tell you he's gonna be something. Welcome aboard, Rick. And we have heard from the proudest mayor of Jacksonville, North Carolina, since Mayor George Jones, speaking on behalf of Mayor Pro Tem Mike Lazara, Councilman Jerry Bittner, Councilman Jerome Willingham, Councilman Randy Thomas, Councilwoman Angelia Washington, and the most visionary, personable city manager most of us will ever see. I went to the swearing-in ceremony for the recently re-elected commissioners shortly after the last election, and it was really something to be there. Every one of the re-elected commissioners, every one of them, as well as those who were still serving an uncompleted term, Everyone was upbeat, positive, and simply could not say enough about the spirit of teamwork, cooperation, and mutual respect that Mayor Phillips and Dr. Woodruff have fostered. Well done, guys. <laughs> and by now, I'm sure everyone in this community knows how I feel about this group of county commissioners and this county manager. I've been a community college administrator in three states for more than 40 years, and I have never encountered a management duo of the caliber, the ability, and the vision of Jeff Hudson and Dr. Richard Woodruff. And Chairman Paul Buchanan, Vice Chairman Barbara Eichner, Commissioner W.C. Jarman, Commissioner Lionel Midget, and Commissioner Jack Bright have been the strongest, most consistent supporters of Coastal Carolina Community College that I have ever worked with in my career. Thank you, folks. <laughs> to both of these two remarkable groups of elected officials, thank you 
for strengthening this community's public leadership team with two superstars and for the tremendous confidence you have shown in their talents and unique strengths. As we've heard this morning, the next few years are going to bring some serious challenges for this unusual military community. But this is a community full of heroes, and not all of them wear a uniform. And we have proven over and over and over again that when this community has the right people in the right leadership positions, there are no challenges we cannot overcome. To this exceptional chamber, to its governmental affairs committee, and to a very patriotic sponsor, Jones Onslow EMC, thank you for once again reminding us who we are when the chips are down and that leadership really matters. Thank you. We have about, I think this is a record, in 19 years, we have a few minutes for questions. <laughs> it's a rare treat to have this collection of leadership in the room. We only have a few moments, but if anyone has a question for any of our speakers today, speak now or you know the deal. We have a microphone in the back of the room if anyone has a question. Seeing none, it is my pleasure to bring Mr. Scott back up. Well, when there are no questions, it means the presenters did their job. So great job, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Jacksonville, on the Greater Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce, thank you for your time and your attendance this morning. I would like to, at this time, recognize, where's Janet Bowen? Janet, come here. <laughs> Our Director of Operations and the shoulders for which this fell upon, Janet Bowen, and the rest of the Chamber staff. <laughs> come on, guys. Come on, guys. <laughs> Elena, Teresa, Million. Thank you all so very much. <laughs> Lorette, I would like to publicly recognize you and thank you for your leadership, stepping into the role of president of our chamber. Thank you for the job that you're doing. Colonel Salmon, thank you again for your generous hospitality for hosting this event for the 19th year. Jones Onslow, thank you guys for your continued support of this community and for keeping the lights on. <laughs> To all of our presenters, again, thank you for presenting this morning and bringing us up to date on the state of this community. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you for your time and attendance.